This is the New England Journal of Medicine COVID-19 update for May 12th, 2021. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the Journal, and I'm joined by Eric Rubin, Editor-in-Chief, and Lindsay Baden, Deputy Editor. Today, we're also joined by Dr. Glenda Gray. Glenda is a pediatrician and a professor at the University of the Witwatersrand. She's done vital research in HIV in South Africa, particularly in children, and she's made important contributions to the care of people living with HIV. In 2014, she was appointed president and CEO of the South African Medical Research Council, which is somewhat analogous to the U.S. National Institutes of Health, and she's led the MRC through a time of vast expansion of HIV care. Currently, she's also a member of the panel advising the South African government on its response to COVID-19. What we'd want to do today is talk about the current situation in South Africa, but before we do that, let's discuss a couple of recently published articles we've seen in the journal. First, we've been hearing more about how well different vaccines might protect against different variant viruses. So what did we know before we saw this work? Steve, we've heard a good deal about how well serum from patients vaccinated with various vaccines are able to neutralize the viral variants that are circulating. And today we learned a little bit more. Before we go into the details, though, it's important to emphasize that we're discussing a purely in vitro observation. As we've said on several prior occasions, we don't yet know how well or even if neutralizing antibody levels correlate with protection. Nevertheless, these are probably the best early indicators we have of protection, even if we don't completely understand their reliability. Thus far, there seems to be a relatively consistent message across the various vaccines. All induce high titers of antibody against the original viral strain, the one that contains a spike protein antigen more or less identical to the one that's in each of the vaccines. They produce similar responses against B117, the variant first described in the UK, and a somewhat lower response to P1, the variant first seen in Brazil, and lower responses still to B1351, the strain that was identified in South Africa. The piece we published today looked at serum from patients who'd received BNT162B2, the Pfizer vaccine. What did we learn that was new there? This group of investigators extended their previous observations, looking at three additional viral variants. These include the B1429 strain, which was first identified in California, the B1526 strain first seen in New York, and a variant of a variant, the B117 strain with an additional amino acid substitution, E484K, which has been fairly concerning in other strains. The B1429 strain, like B117 and B1351, is considered a variant of concern as it looks like it might be more transmissible and be less well neutralized by therapeutic monoclonal antibodies. The investigators used an assay to measure neutralization by sera collected from individuals who'd received their second vaccine dose two to four weeks prior to the collection. And the results were pretty encouraging. Overall, the neutralizing ability for each of the viruses was similar, although slightly reduced for B1429. If that does correlate with protection, it's good news. But it is a little early to conclude that. Eric, over the last several weeks to months, we've discussed a lot about what in vitro data mean in terms of protection. And we still have more to learn. But I think what we continually see from these variants emerging is, is this convergent evolution where different viruses in different parts of the globe are under similar selective pressure because of the nature of the immune system in response to this virus as it better adapts to us? Or is this increased fitness and a given variant emerges that is able to transmit much more efficiently and spread globally? These have somewhat different implications in how we think about control and where we're likely to be a few weeks to months from now as we see further emergence of variant viruses. Another point, Lindsay, is that we know something about the difference between the responses induced by vaccines and induced by natural infection. What we can tell, of course, is that they are qualitatively different and that natural infection induces responses, both antibody and presumably T-cell responses, to a variety of different antigens, not just the spike protein. But on the other hand, the vaccines, for the most part, induce a different quantitative response in that the antibody responses, at least, induced by most of the vaccines are more robust than after natural infection. And 
that might make a difference. Certainly that quantitative change might provide better protection than natural infection. That seems to be borne out in real world effectiveness studies so far. And hopefully it will continue as we see more and more variants. Of course, this is evolution. Evolution means that there's gonna be a generation of all sorts of things, including those that are capable of escape or better escape from the immune control induced by vaccination. Hopefully we'll get more of a handle on the epidemic before that happens. I agree that the immune response elicited by vaccination, particularly the vaccines targeting the spike, appeared to be higher on certain assays than natural infection. However, the importance of this, as you alluded to, remains unclear, although it makes sense that that affords some kind of direct protection. Although a lot of the protection, I suspect, when one is challenged with a wild-type virus down the road, has to do with an anamnestic response, not just a pre-existing circulating response. So I think the nature of the immunologic protection, I think we're just in a different place now than 18 months ago when the global population was seronaive. And now having a significant proportion of the population either experienced with wild type infection or with vaccine elicited immunity that can then be boosted with a subsequent antigenic challenge, either through revaccination or wild type infection, is likely to be different. But I agree, I like having high titer neutralizing antibody that feels protective. And as data emerge, we'll better understand how protective, particularly against different variants that emerge. Another piece we published today addressed the question of vaccine acceptance. This was an observational study in an unusual population, prisoners in the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. What did we learn from that study? This was a descriptive study in which the investigators tried to figure out what the demographic characteristics were of prisoners who were offered vaccine and subsequently accepted that vaccine. During a period from late December to the beginning of March, almost 98,000 correctional facility residents were offered vaccination with either the Pfizer vaccine or mRNA 1273, the Moderna vaccine, and about two thirds of them accepted. The acceptance was highest among Hispanic and white residents and lowest for black residents and higher among older than younger people. Strikingly, for those who declined vaccination initially, almost half accepted it when it was offered for a second time. The authors conclude that vaccine hesitancy varies in different demographic groups, but it can change over time. It is interesting to see this experience in a very well-characterized captive population, but it's a highly unusual group, and it's not clear how these observations will hold up in other populations. I agree that this is a unique population. However, the principle that emerges does resonate. There has been a lot of vaccine hesitancy in many communities, some of which have begun to increase their uptake and acceptance of vaccination. And I think in part due to education, greater experience with these vaccines, more data on efficacy and safety. And perhaps that played a role in this population as well as evidenced by the increased acceptance with re-offering of the vaccine. These data also suggest that those individuals at highest risk for complications, such as the older individuals, were more likely to accept the vaccine. Again, in my mind, speaking to the need for education and understanding risk factors and helping our patients and our communities have a proper risk-benefit balance and understanding not only the risk to myself as I get older, this is more protective, but also to those around me so that the uptake of vaccination helps decrease the risk for the individual and their community. So I think these data I find encouraging, although there still is a lot more work to be done to get communities, even this unique community, to accept vaccination. This is certainly a high risk group of individuals as we know that COVID-19 has spread very widely within prisons. But I think the very encouraging news, I agree, is that not only the uptake was fairly reasonable for total numbers, but also the fact that you could offer it twice suggests that interventions that are more aggressive than simply 
making the vaccine available, which is largely what's been done up until this point, can be effective at increasing uptake rates. So we'll have to see how well that translates, but I'm hoping that we can do better with vaccine hesitancy in general by thinking about how to target individuals. Glenda, in South Africa, you've seen large outbreaks of COVID-19, but you've also been able to institute effective control measures. What's the situation look like now? Thank you. Yes, South Africa has had one of the worst epidemics in Africa. And even though we underpenetrated for testing, we have documented about 1.6 million infections since the beginning of the pandemic and reported official deaths around 54,825. But this is a third of the excess deaths that we've seen over the same time period. So we've obviously underreported COVID deaths in our country and have three times the amount of excess deaths, which show the huge burden of COVID-19 in our country. We are about to enter the third wave. As we go into our winter months, we are seeing an uptick of both infections and deaths in our hospitals. And we're starting to see healthcare workers becoming infected as well. So we anticipate a third wave. It's hard to predict how severe our third wave will be. You know, we have the B1351 variant that's circulating in our country. And we've also had reports of the B1617.2 variant from India that's been detected in our country, as well as the B117. So it's going to be very important to see how this plays out in our country. We're seeing an uptick of infections in our more rural areas, the parts of our country that weren't exposed in the first and second wave to the virus. And I guess with the recent reports of the B1617.2, we're going to have to see how that plays out with our variant, the 1351. So I think we are concerned. We know we also need to evaluate what impact the emerging variant from India has on vaccine efficacy in South Africa. So all in all, we are seeing a huge burden of disease. We also obviously have a shortage of therapeutic options, and we still also are about to start our national vaccine program. Up until now, we have been able to vaccinate just under half a million healthcare workers. We hope to finish that last 100,000 this week. And this was in a phase 3B open label study using the J&J vaccine. Next week, we will start our official rollout and we'll start with the Pfizer program. But that will also take a while and so we can really scale up to get to the kind of numbers we need to start to see an impact on the epidemic. Wendell, what is it about South Africa as opposed to the rest of the continent? Um, it, certainly reports have been that in many African countries, the rates are lower than they have been in South Africa. Is that a matter of inadequate testing, do you think? Or do you think there's something very different going on? I think there's a lot of under-reporting in the rest of Africa, and I think there's a huge degree of under-testing. So South Africa has not been able to scale up testing to the kind of numbers you see in Europe and in the U.S. Certainly in the U.S. in the beginning, you, you also struggled as there was a shortage of capacity. So I think that first of all is that, you know, a lot of the COVID infections are undetected in Africa. And it's also because of the issues around surveillance and death registers and death on hospital admissions, it's very hard to get a true handle on the burden. But certainly South Africa has been greatly affected. And I think it might be because of the huge amount of travel that happens between South Africa and the rest of the world. So we've had a lot of travel from the US, from Europe and from Asia. And in the beginning, our epidemic was largely fueled by transmission coming from Europe. You know, European travelers in our coastal areas for tourism were part of the beginning of our pandemic. So we do see a lot of infections also, and I think because we are able to track death, um, hospital admissions, and we were able to test more than anyone else in the continent, we're able to articulate our pandemic a bit more. But I still think we are under-reporting the true burden of COVID infections in our country. So, Glenda, you mentioned the B1351 variant, and of course, that introduces a particular challenge. Pre-existing immunity is often not fully protected. As we've published in the journal, people who were previously infected with other variants and those who've received vaccines can still get infected and sometimes become severely ill. That's made managing vaccination difficult in South Africa. How have you approached this issue? Yeah, it's a great concern to us, and we've had to alter our vaccination program quite dramatically based on the circulating variants. So last year, we were evaluating Pfizer, AstraZeneca, Novavax, and the J&J &J vaccine in South Africa. 
we participated in Ensemble One, which was a multi-country study that evaluated the effectiveness of the Ad26 vaccine in four continents. South Africa contributed just under 7,000 people to the study. And when we were rolling out the study, it was at the time when the new circulating variant 1351 emerged in our country. So we had direct data on the efficacy of the A26 vaccine in our country. And we found that although the efficacy was a little bit less than what was seen in the US and in South America, we still had around 64% overall efficacy in the vaccine in the presence of the B1351 variant. And so we're confident that there is vaccine efficacy using the A26 vaccine. We've got limited data on the Pfizer vaccine. We enrolled about 800 participants in the Pfizer program. And of that, there is some reassuring data that there was vaccine efficacy against the variant. However, we are going to obviously have to monitor vaccine efficacy as we roll it out, as we are doing the same with the A26. The recent data from the NEJM also is reassuring that the Pfizer vaccine, the mRNA, is effective against the 1351 variant. But we will be doing field evaluation in the rollout to monitor breakthrough infections and to see the impact of the vaccine on viral escape and breakthrough infections. So it's very important as we see the emergence of other variants in our country using the Pfizer and the A26 vaccine, we will also have to evaluate the breakthrough infections and try and evaluate the impact of the new variants that are emerging in our country on vaccine efficacy. So it's very important. We had planned to roll out the AstraZeneca vaccine in South Africa and data coming from South Africa showed that the vaccine efficacy was reduced with the emergence of the 1351 variant. And therefore, we had to abandon our vaccine program to roll out the AstraZeneca. So we were delayed with our rollout because of this, and we had to go and renegotiate with other manufacturers to make sure that we could bring in vaccines into South Africa that were effective against our variants. So we are behind. As you know, the whole of Africa is severely behind on its vaccination program, including South Africa. And we hope that as vaccine supply is limited and we are constrained in South Africa, and we hope that towards July, August this year, the vaccine pipeline will open up for our country. Linda, how difficult is it to obtain vaccines? As you know, there's controversy right now in this country as to how we should be sharing the vaccines that the U.S. has already secured. What would actually help South Africa to obtain vaccines? Well, I think at a global level, countries are struggling with access to vaccines and countries are even suing manufacturers for delays in manufacturing. So if you are a low middle income country, you're right at the bottom of the food chain and it's much harder for you to negotiate, first of all, given the size of your country and the value of your currency. So South Africa you know, has looked at various options. They've looked at the COVAX option and they've also looked at negotiating with various pharmaceutical companies. And those negotiations have led to vaccine access, particularly with Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson. But there is a pipeline problem at the moment, even with J&J, because we know of the issues that have faced some of the manufacturing plants in the US has affected our supply. And so we've had to delay our rollout of the J&J program because of the problems that emerged from the Baltimore plant in the US, which was supplying the Aspen manufacturing plant in South Africa, who was doing the fill and finish of our program. So that has delayed us a lot. So any manufacturing delay has a knock-on effect, and particularly for poorer countries who are scrambling for the odd million doses that may be spare. So we hope that the vaccine pipeline will open up. We start our program, the national rollout, in mid-May, just before winter and at the start of the third wave. And so obviously there's a lot of anxiety about whether we can get to the essential service people and the frontline workers to do this. In terms of vaccine hesitancy, we obviously have seen some vaccine hesitancy since the pause. We were rolling out the J&J A26 vaccine to healthcare workers. When the FDA and CDC paused the supply to the US, this had a knock-on effect in South Africa and our regulatory authority also paused our rollout and it took us two weeks to reopen the rollout of the Sasanke study, of our study. And after we opened it up again, there was a lot of vaccine hesitancy. Healthcare workers were concerned about their safety. And we've had to spend a lot of time uh, addressing vaccine hesitancy. Fortunately, in looking at household surveys in South Africa, we've seen around 70% of people agree that they will take a vaccine. And I think the same thing as what you saw in your article that's just been published, is that seeing peers 
being vaccinated and being given a second time to think about it may increase issues around vaccine hesitancy. But also, I think there's issue of trust. Uh, we have to address the issues of trust, the issues of how people view medical science, and also the issues of anti-vaxxers and conspiracy theorists that sometimes impact on our ability to uh, roll out the vaccines. I think those are very important issues that we have to raise. But at the moment, the good news is that as we enter our last week of the Sasanki study, we've seen a huge demand for vaccines by healthcare workers as the vaccine program closes ahead of the national rollout. I mean, manufacturing is a real bottleneck globally. What is happening in South Africa to enhance manufacturing capabilities? And that's a good question. So we have two entities that could expand manufacturing capability. One is a partly owned by government program, and then the other one is a private entity. And it is quite clear, given this pandemic, as Africa and certainly South Africa has realized that we lack adequate manufacturing capability. And if there's anything we have to invest in in the future is manufacturing. And to this end, we have been talking to various people about partnership and public-private partnerships, and also with various manufacturers to see whether we can do some of the tech transfer program that goes beyond fill and finish. But it's quite clear that there has to be public funding of this. There has to be public funds committed by our government to manufacturing for us to build a thriving vaccine program, much like we see in India in the Serum Institute. South Africa needs a Serum Institute. We need to be able to manufacture our own vaccines for our country and for Africa going forward. Glenda, you mentioned that a variety of vaccines have been studied in South Africa, particularly during the period of time when 351 was emerging. And that has provided very important insight about potential activity of these vaccines against this virus and these emerging strains. Do you have a sense with the rollout if the difference between infection versus severe illness continues as seen initially in the studies? Are these vaccines preventing severe disease? That's a very important point. And one of the most important things about the rollout is to monitor field effectiveness and the effectiveness of these vaccines on the ground. And in our program with healthcare workers, of around just under 400,000 healthcare workers, we've been monitoring breakthrough infections to see what happens. And obviously, we've mostly focused on infections that are occurring after 14 days and after 28 days and monitoring to see what's happening with mild, moderate and severe COVID as well as hospitalization and death. It's good to report that as of today, we would had no healthcare worker that has died after being vaccinated in it after 28 days. Certainly, we've had, from what I know of, is two admissions by healthcare workers and some breakthrough infections. So we're busy evaluating that. And we're busy also, whenever there's a breakthrough infection in South Africa, we do do a genetic analysis of the swab. And we also do um, bloods to see what kind of immune response the vaccine induced and whether there's been any vaccine failure. So that's critical and that's important to continue to do. So we have a lot of information and every breakthrough infection is fully evaluated. Fortunately as well, uh, we've been able to also work with the back end of the program. And so we're able to tap into the death register, hospitalization register, as well as the COVID infections to try and make sure we can validate the information we get from passive reports from healthcare workers. So it's going to be critical information. You know, So this will provide the first half a million effectiveness study on the Air 26 program in the South African setting. Healthcare workers are four to seven times more likely to get COVID than any other worker in our country. So they're an important group to study and to evaluate what's happening. And also in terms of variants, you know, they're going to be the ones that are going to be exposed to emerging variants in their line of duty as they work in the hospitals and in patient-facing areas. Glenda, as you suggest, South Africa has been publishing significant research on COVID-19, ranging from basic science to clinical trials. And this builds on the tremendous infectious disease research infrastructure that you've built over the last couple of decades, primarily focusing on HIV and tuberculosis. It's an impressive accomplishment, but in the meantime, HIV and TB haven't gone away as clinical problems in South Africa. What's happening to the care of patients with these diseases in the era of COVID-19? That's an important question. As you know, South Africa has one of the largest HIV epidemics in the world, as well as a huge TB epidemic. And there have been huge unintended health effects of COVID-19 in our country. We've seen a large drop-off of people getting antiretroviral therapy, 
a large drop-off of art visits and retroviral treatment visits and a large drop-off of TB tests. In a survey done in people who use health systems, we saw that out of one in four respondents, they had been unable to access medications, including things like contraception and condoms. And in people who had chronic diseases, one in five people reported that they could not access their HIV or TB treatment. And this is a very important thing. If you also look at other things like antenatal care, about a third of women who are pregnant in South Africa are also HIV infected. And we've seen that one in 10 HIV infected pregnant women ran out of antiretroviral therapy because they were afraid of going to the health system because they were afraid of getting coronavirus. And so that's a very important thing. You know, we need pregnant women who are newly diagnosed, who are HIV infected to take treatment so that they can also prevent mother to child transmission. So when people are afraid to go to the health system because of getting coronavirus or they're scared that the facility may have run out of treatment, this prohibits access. We also saw that a lot of women also did not take their children for immunizations. And so we had a huge drop off of immunization during last year. So we obviously are concerned. We are concerned by the lack of access of antenatal care because women are scared to go to facilities because they're scared they may get coronavirus. We're also concerned that we may see a resurgence of some infectious diseases in children, which may affect our under five and infant mortality rate because moms aren't going to get their children immunized because they're scared of going to the facilities. And worst of all, you know, we are seeing a drop off in people getting viral loads and their CD4 counts taken and TB tests done which means that there are a lot of people that are walking around South Africa with TB and continuing to spread it in the communities and people who've fallen off the antiretroviral treatment and we're at risk of huge amounts of resurgence and transmission. South Africa has one of the highest HIV incidence rates amongst young women on the continent. And so lack of access to condoms is a huge problem for our control of HIV in South Africa. Also lack of access to antiretroviral therapy means people rebound And not only will it impact on their health, but it will impact on transmission. We see a lot of morbidity and mortality in HIV-infected people who get COVID, and they're more likely to do worse than other people in our country. So a risk factor for a bad COVID outcome will be HIV infection. And so our inability to make sure that people who are on chronic meds get their medication will impact also on COVID infection. Um, In people who are HIV infected who aren't on their treatment, they are probably viremic and have low CD4 counts. And we're worried about people who are um, viremic, who have COVID-19, also to chronically shed SARS-CoV-2. And we have seen some reports of chronic shedders in South Africa, and we worry about the impact that the shedding will have on viral evolution. And it's very critical for us to control HIV infection in South Africa because this may have an adverse impact on the emergence of variants in our country. Glenda, I wonder if the vaccine rollout, when it occurs at a larger scale, will provide an opportunity to re-engage people with care in general for those people who've fallen off of the HIV treatment pathway, for those people who haven't been tested for HIV or TB. I wonder if getting them into a facility is an opportunity to once again engage. I mean, I hope so. The health system in South Africa is very fragile and it's in a very precarious position. And certainly COVID-19 has exposed vulnerability. And we've seen the impact of hospital admissions on all health systems and on all um, kind of cold surgery and emergency medicine. And so the quicker we can vaccinate people, vaccination will have a public health benefit. Uh, It has an individual health benefit and the public health benefit will be relieving the hospital from admission so that we can get on with the work of managing TB, HIV, and other chronic illnesses in our country. It has been devastating on our fragile health system, and the quicker we can keep people out of hospital by immunizing them, the quicker we can then get on to supporting the people in our country who have chronic illnesses. Glenda, given the impact on routine care, Have you seen increases in TB cases, HIV cases, or vaccine-preventable illnesses, given all of the deficiencies in care in those spaces? You raise an important question. So we've been monitoring viral loads and TB diagnostics over the last year, and have seen a decline in the amount of people coming forward to do their viral loads and their TB tests. 
So we do believe that there is a resurgence. And if you look at our excess deaths, so we have about 157,000 excess deaths in South Africa at the time of the pandemic. And we have around just under 55,000 reported deaths due to COVID. And a lot of questions have been asked in our country, um, how much of the excess deaths that we see in our country are due to HIV and TB or the lack of access to healthcare because of COVID. So we believe that part of the excess deaths is related to COVID itself per se, but there is probably a substantial amount of excess deaths in our country at this moment that's attributable to HIV and TB as well, or a combination of both COVID, TB and HIV. We do see with our vaccination program with healthcare workers, where we do have HIV infected healthcare workers, we see a huge amount of COVID infection. And when we investigate those healthcare workers, they are really sick from HIV. They've fallen off their treatment and have low CD4 counts and also have concomitant TB. So we do suspect a lot. And as we start to work on our burden of disease and as we try to unravel all the deaths that have happened in South Africa in the last year, we will be able to get a better picture of the magnitude of the pandemic on other diseases like HIV and TB. Thank you, Eric and Lindsay, and thank you particularly, Glenda, for joining us today.